Gustong paglalapat ng pamumuno at patupad sa masa. Pagkakaisa, pagsulong Narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto Pagdaluyong Narito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat Na puloy Magiging muok Na buok Pagkakaisa Paglaban Tagumpay Paglayan sa katauhan Narito tayo Para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong Narito tayo Para sa masangapin Para sa pino Narito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat Na puloy Magiging muog Na Ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, episode, today's episode to the National Democratic Line Online. Our topic today is Lenin's critique on monopoly capitalism. And our input speaker is uh, no other than the chair emeritus of the International League of People's Struggle, Professor Jose Maria Sison. Please help me welcome Professor Jose Maria Sison. Mm -hmm. the, thank you for having me as the, uh, the, the speaker to answer the, the questions that have been advanced. Uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, uh, being with you. I'm delighted to be with you. And I uh, uh, express my warmest greetings of solidarity and uh, best wishes to you, uh, Pebe, and to all our listeners. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sison. I'm also very glad to see you. It's an opportunity always to converse with you because not every scholar, Filipino scholar, will have a chance to talk to you. And it's like uh, the best of all opportunities to be able to ask you to interview you online. And also, I uh, appreciate that people are coming in to see. Uh, this episode, especially our very important topic today. Now, let's proceed to the first question. Uh, the first question is, could you give us an overview on Lenin's mapping out on how capitalism, that is supposed to be a system of free global competition, ironically only matures or leads into monopolies, creating satellite state dependencies serving as markets, investment outlets, and sources of raw materials. Why? Hmm. Lenin learned from Marx that free competition had developed to monopoly capitalism by the middle of the 19th century in England. Uh, uh, before that, uh, the slogan of free trade was raised uh, in connection with the colonial enterprises. The capitalist class had accumulated capital by extracting the surplus value from the total value created by labor. The accumulation and concentration of capital reached the level of monopoly capitalism 
when one or a few large companies arose to control entire lines of industry and monopoly capitalism became dominant in the entire economy. England had the advantage over other capitalist countries because it was ahead in acquiring colonies and developing large-scale machine production. Lenin further observed that monopoly capitalism subsequently developed in other European countries and the US from 1870 onward, so that in the last decade of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, there were several imperialist countries competing to acquire colonies, semi-colonies and dependent countries to serve as sources of raw materials, markets and investments outlet. Thus, in his September 1917 masterwork, Imperialism, Highest Stage of Capitalism, he described the era as one of modern imperialism and the world proletarian revolution. He described the five features of imperialism as follows. Uh, one, monopoly capitalism has become dominant in the economy. Uh, two, when bank capital has merged with industrial capital to become finance capital. Three, when the export of surplus capital has gained importance over the export of surplus goods and takes the form of direct investments and loans. Four, when monopoly firms in certain countries combine income tells and syndicates to compete with those in other countries. And five, the division of the world has been completed in economic terms as sources of raw materials, markets, and fields of investments, and in political terms as colonies, semi-colonies, dependent countries, and spheres of influence of imperialist countries. The economic competition of monopolies in various countries can lead to a struggle for a redivision of the world among the imperialist powers and to wars for the expansion of economic territory and political hegemony. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. That's a clear mapping out. And now five uh, important developments or evolution of imperialism took place to uh, pave the way to monopolies. The second question, is there no way to avoid that law of economic concentration in the hands of a few? Is it always a natural, unanticipated outcome? Can't formation of monopolies be avoided? A capitalist enterprise that does not win in the competition with other enterprises and does not make profits and expand is bound to sink in the period of free competition capitalism, as well as in the period of monopoly capitalism. Competition is the very cause for the private owners of the means of production to accumulate and concentrate capital. The capitalist winners in the competition take over the businesses of the losing capitalists. Thus, monopoly capitalism has historically grown out of free competition. There is no way for an industrial capitalist economy to avoid the law of economic concentration in the hands of a few, so long as the means of production are owned by them and the exploitation of labor is under their control. Because of competition, there is anarchy of production and the constant drive of the competing capitalists to accumulate constant capital and reduce the variable capital for wages. This results in boom and bust cycles due to the crisis of overproduction and destruction of productive capacity. While certain capitalists go bankrupt, the winning capitalists expand their enterprises and uh, accumulate capital. Competition among the capitalists from the period of free competition to the period of monopoly capitalism drove the winning capitalists to increase the organic composition of their capital by favoring the buildup of constant capital in the form of more efficient equipment, raw materials, and plant, and uh, reducing the variable capital for wages. The crisis of overproduction occurs because wage incomes fall and the products of labor cannot be absorbed by the shrinking market and the profit rate also falls. But after a round of recession and stagnation, there can be a new round of 
uh, reinvestment uh, with the winning capitalist uh, gaining from the losses of the losing uh, capitalist. Uh, uh, the capitalist attacks on the working class, humanity and environment continue. Great depressions can also arise from the crisis of overproduction afflicting the entire world capitalist system and can result in violent struggles for a redivision of the world, leading to the extremely destructive inter-imperialist wars like World War I and World War II, resulting in the emergence of socialist countries as well as the re-strengthening of imperialist countries that continue to survive. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor. So that's the reason why we have this boom-bust cycle, so the Conrad Tiff cycles. But the third question, so what is that critical element that transformed capitalism into the phenomenon called imperialism as a natural trajectory in most European capitalist countries in Lenin's time? Is imperialism really an inevitable course or flow of capitalist growth? Why? Due to the private ownership of the means of production and the competition among the private owners of capital, the capitalists are driven to beat their competitors and take over the business of the losing capitalists. The winning capitalists expand their business and in the process accumulate and concentrate more capital in their hands. Thus, monopoly capitalism grew out of free competition capitalism. Failure to expand means failure to keep the profit rate from falling and to overcome the crisis of overproduction. The big problem for the monopoly capitalist in several industrial capitalist countries to redivide the world is that in the era of modern imperialism, the division of the world has been completed since the beginning of the 20th century and attempts by one or several imperialist countries to redivide the world can provoke inter-imperialist wars like uh, World War One and uh, World War II. Uh, even at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, uh, monopoly capitalist countries that had no colonies had to um, uh, declare a war on old uh, colonial systems like the US uh, uh, declaring war on Spain in order to acquire colonies. So um, uh, the newcomers, in, in the game of uh, colonialism were uh, imperial or monopoly capitalist uh, countries that would include uh, uh, Japan and uh, Germany. Since after World War II, um, the imperialist powers have been able to avoid direct wars uh, among themselves for fear of mutually assured destruction by nuclear weapons. In the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union as superpowers, the latter was able to break in 1949 their nuclear monopoly and blackmail by the former, and thus the nuclear stalemate has persisted since then. The imperialist powers, including the Soviet Union, after it became social imperialist, sought to override the crisis of the world capitalist system and inter-imperialist contradictions by shifting the burden of the economic and financial crisis of the world capitalist system to the underdeveloped countries. Mm. While avoiding direct war among themselves, the imperialist powers have carried out wars of aggression against underdeveloped countries as well as proxy wars among client states. Yeah, because there were two meetings, the Yalta meeting and the Potsdam meeting that only resulted with the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So thank you so much for that sharing, Professor. Now we proceed to the fourth question. Tracing back the history of the Great Wars, First World War and the Second World War, what were the triggers of these wars that made Lenin consider them as wars engaged in the name of capitalist expansion and integral to the imperialist order at that time? Lenin studied closely the background and course of World War I. He observed that the root causes of the war were the competition over economic territory and political rivalry for hegemony. War ensues from the attempt of an imperialist power or block of imperialist powers to expand its monopoly capitalist interest and thereby to redivide the world 
and upset the balance of forces in the status quo. Lenin put forward the line that the imperialist war could be turned into a revolutionary civil war for the proletariat to seize political power and build socialism. Before and during World War II, the fascist Axis powers made it a point to attack and suppress the proletarian revolutionaries and other democratic forces in order to serve the interest of monopoly capitalism and other reactionary forces. It was a matter of political wisdom and necessity for the Soviet Union to join the Allied forces in order to fight and defeat the fascist powers and enable the rise of several more socialist countries and advance the national liberation movements. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. Now let's go to the fifth. What was Lenin's explication of the parallelism between the inequality of social classes and that of the uneven development of nation states that brought about imperialism in the interstate arena? The capital in the private hands of the capitalist class is accumulated through the exploitative process of extracting surplus value from labor power of the working class. The system of exploitation and private ownership of the means of production by a few perpetuate and aggravate the uneven development in developed countries. The division of society into exploiting and exploited classes and the persistence of gross inequality and mass poverty. Uneven development, inequality of social classes, and mass poverty in underdeveloped countries are far worse than in developed countries. The oppressed peoples and nations in the underdeveloped countries suffer exploitation by the local exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists, as well as by imperialist powers. In the name of development, the imperialist powers aggravate underdevelopment and social inequality in underdeveloped countries by plundering the natural and human resources and taking super profits through direct investments, unequal trade, and onerous loans. Okay, I can see that too. Thank you. Now, the sixth question. Some nations believe that it is ideal for capital capital abundant nations and capital scarce nations to have some sort of interdependence. But then Lenin's treatise on imperialism as a higher stage of capitalism appears to be critical against such relations. What are the reasons or the basis for his findings and critique? The so-called interdependence of imperialist powers and underdeveloped countries is uh, grossly lopsided in favor of the imperialist countries. The imperialist powers as capital abundant nations have no interest in the comprehensive uh, and fundamental development of the capital scarce nations. They deliberately keep the majority of countries of the world underdeveloped as cheap sources of raw materials and labor power, markets for surplus goods and fields of investments for extracting super profits at the least cost. The imperialist countries extract super profits from the perpetuated ex exchange of its expensive manufacturers with the cheap raw materials from the underdeveloped countries, as well as from direct investments to gain ownership over local productive assets and exploit the labor of the local working people and gain even bigger profits from the practice of international usury. Thus, the imperialist powers are hostile to demands for national independence, social justice, and development. So therefore, if we look at the whole context of things, um, imperialist powers only sustain source of raw materials forever, and also source of cheap labor, and as dumping ground or markets of products. Now, let's go to the next question. Um, what does Lenin mean by the necessity of the duality of, po of poverty and prosperity as a durable tandem that sustains the logic of capitalism into its interstate level? The logic of capitalism is to keep the capitalist class prosperous and to keep the workers impoverished 
so that they are compelled to sell their labor power cheaply to the capitalist class in order to obtain the means of their subsistence. The capitalist classes adhere to such logic from the time of the primitive accumulation of capital, uh, which included colonial plunder, dispossession of peasants, and the expansion of manufacturing to the period of free competition and further to the current era of modern imperialism. The capitalist system deliberately keeps a certain portion of the working class unemployed as a reserve army of labor for the dual purpose of pushing down the general wage level and having a ready source of cheap labor power during certain seasons of the year and also during boom periods in the business cycle. This method of exploitation is conspicuous in the application of the so-called policy of uh, flexible labor or short-term contractualization under neoliberalism. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Now we proceed to the eighth question. In recent development, could you map out how has capitalism's finance and production structures overpowered poor states in favor of the owners of capital, the owners of big biotechnology, the owners of big oil, the owners of big corporations, or the owners of big pharmaceuticals, and that world military industrial complex? The monopoly capitalist owning the big companies in biotech, oil, pharmaceuticals, and the military industrial complex are major shareholders of banks and other financial institutions. They have the economic, financial, political, and military means to overpower the poor states, pay for themselves and their local collaborators, and take super profits through the super exploitation of the people and the natural resources. By owning both the industrial plants as well as the banks and other financial institutions in the imperialist countries, the monopoly capitalists can easily expand industrial production and draw profits from both the spheres of industrial production and finance. Even the comprador big bourgeoisie, which are in fact agents of foreign monopoly capitalism, economies like that of the Philippines excel at expanding business interest and raising the profit rate by owning and controlling banks, manufacturing enterprises, and trading firms. Okay, true. Now, let's have the last question before we uh, have a break and uh, ask and solicit questions from the audience. The ninth question, given the previous question, is there a way to re reverse these trends? How should poorer states deal with these big capitalists in order for them to survive and be free from the entanglements and exploitative imposition of these institutions? The way to undo the dominance of monopoly capitalism is for the proletariat to lead the broad masses of the people, to engage in all forms of revolutionary struggle in order to realize national and social liberation. The People's Democratic Revolution through protracted people's war is possible in most underdeveloped countries and is most needed because of the escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation brought about by the neoliberal policy of unbridled greed, state terrorism, and wars of aggression. The proletariat and people in imperialist countries are suffering from the consequences of the worsening crisis of the world capitalist system due to the bankruptcy of neoliberalism, the gross social inequality, the precarity and dwindling of the middle class, the increasing use of state terrorism domestically and internationally, and the rise of war production and aggressive wars. With their revolutionary party, the proletariat must intensify their class struggle against the monopoly bourgeoisie for the benefit of the people and in the interest of proletarian internationalism and anti-imperialist international solidarity. U.S. imperialism, the number one imperialist power since the end of World War II, continues to be on a strategic decline since its peak of power from 1945 to 1975. For a while, it was overweening with arrogance as the sole superpower after the restoration of capitalism in China in 1976 
1978 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But since the financial meltdown of 2008 and the prolongation of the crisis of the world capitalist system, the strategic decline of the U.S. has accelerated and become more pronounced. With the addition of Russia and China to the circle of imperialist powers, the crisis of the world capitalist system has worsened rapidly, and the inter-imperialist contradictions have escalated. The U.S. and China, previously the main partners under the banner of neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization, are engaged in bitter conflicts over a wide range of issues, including trade, finance, and theft of technology. The two imperialist powers are fighting for hegemony over the world and are undermining each other. In the meantime, the proletariat and people in all types of countries, developed and underdeveloped, are rising up in anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles on an unprecedented scale against the escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation. This is a time for further intensifying and expanding the mass struggles and building the revolutionary party of the proletariat, the revolutionary mass organizations, self-defense organizations, and local organs of political power. This is a time for preparing the resurgence of the world proletarian socialist revolution. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sisson. And for the audience, I hope you were able to see how Professor, our input, Professor Sisson, the input speaker this afternoon, was able to map out the rise of monopoly capitalism that is very much inevitable with uh, competition or competition capitalism there will always come to be monopolies. And on the process, it will go to that level of imperialism. Now, we will have a short break, and uh, we expect that you raise your questions at the chat box, and then we are going back in the second half to answer those questions. Okay. Kasi ni Duterte, ni Pangulong Duterte sa kanyang panunungkulan sa panahon ngayon at sa panahon ng lumipas na limang taon ay kahirapan, pahirap at walang, ka, walang kakwenta-kwentang uh, health response, failed health re response po sa mga manggagawang pangkalusugan at sa mga, uh, mga hospital, sa lahat ng mga pasyente na nangangailangan ng serbisyo ng pangkalusugan. Yung ginawa ni Duterte, Mula nang pagkaupo siya, marami ng violation siyang ginawa. Katulad ng mga pinaguhuli niya na wala naman talaga kaso, lalagyan niya ng gawagawang kaso para lang makulong. Tapos marami pang ano, no, yung mga EGK, marami pinapatay na hindi naman talaga totoong ano, no, totoong connected sa droga. Ang malalang pagpatay niya, basta pinapatay na lang na walang justisya, walang paglilitis. Kung totoo talagang may kasalanan yung taong pinapatay nila o hinuhuli. Uh, Matindi-tinding issue yung iiwanan niya sa mga manggagawa. Uh, kung maalala ko, nung nangangampanya siya, uh, nangako siya na wawakasan niya yung kontraktualisasyon, uh, tataasan niya yung sahod ng mga manggagawa sa pamamagitan ng pagbibigay ng national minimum wage. Tapos lahat yun, uh, binawi na niya ngayon sa panon ng panunong ulan niya. At the same time, uh, palpak yung ginawa niyang uh, handling doon sa pandemic kung saan uh, ikinulong yung mga manggagawa sa, sa mga tahanan. Maraming mga manggagawa ang nawalan ng trabaho, kaya nagresulta ito ng kagutuman sa, sa amin bilang mga manggagawa at pati na rin ang aming mga pamilya. Nang 
Man taon, maliwanag naman yan. Alam yan ang lahat ng Pilipino. Ang legacy na matatandaan ng mga Pilipino kay Duterte. Patayan, kasinungalingan, kabastusan, nakawan, na level up. Hindi lang nakawan na milyon-milyon, bilyon-bilyon na nakawan. At siyempre, hindi mawawala ang kanyang pagka-traidor. Traidor sa bayan si Duterte, no? Pangalawang pagka-traidor niya, usapin ng West Philippine Sea. Alam naman natin kung paano siya nagiging tuta, nagpapakatuta sa China. Lahat ng pabor sa China, ginagawa niya. Lahat ng hindi pabor sa Pilipino, ginagawa rin niya. Kawawa ang ating mga manging isda. Ang West Philippine Sea, naging pag-aari na ng China sa panahon ni Duterte. Walang ibang may iwang legacy sa ang rehimeng Duterte maliban sa pagkalugi ng mga magsasaka dito sa ating bansa. No? Hindi niya sinusuporta mula sa simula pa lamang ang agrikultura ng ating bansa. Hindi niya nilalaanan ng pondo, mas pinapondohan niya pa ang pamamasista niya. Ngayon, alam naman nating lahat na nagpatupad siya ng rice clarification law na nagdulot ng patinding pagkalugi sa ating mga magsasaka. No? Lalo't lalo na sa ating mga magsasaka ng palay. Tinataya ang nasa 90 billion na at mukha pa nga mas mataas ang kinalugi ng mga magsasaka sa palay dahil dulot ng rice clarification law na nagbabagsak dito ng mga imported na bigas na hindi naman sinusuportahan at lalong pinapalugi ang mga ating mga magsasaka sa palay. Paalis na ako, naunahan pa yung araw Almusal ko yung baho Pagawan ng jeep at trabaho At traffic pa sa may kalaw Halos hindi na ako umuwi Puro na lang ako talaw Sa tahanang maliit Kada buwan, limang libo Inuuwi ko, sakit balikat Likot at ulo, malaki na raw Ba't pa ako nagre-reklamo Talagang tiis trabaho Talagang linis ang baho Nang boss na Amerikano Kontrakwal, artiladong katawan Binibigay lahat mula balat hanggang laman Hanap naman ng bago pagtapos ng ilang buwan Ginagawa lahat, magkalaman lang ang dyan Magkano nga ba ang salapi? May trabaho nga ba o magpaapi? Hanggang labi, hanggang kami Mabuhay yung maayos hanggang sa makaraos Wala ang maga hanggang gabi Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Kasi hindi nakatapos At kayo't kalabaw Nakakapamintig sa pagod Nalulunod pero sumusuong pa rin sa agos Parang kailangang sumigaw Para lang di mapaos Matay kong bukura
ka kasama sa presensya mo nang mulila para saan pa bang pera kung buhay pala natin ang nakataya kung inuubos sinabuso na bumalik na at bumagal ang mundo na tutuwa lumakit ang dugo sinugal ko na lahat talaga desperado umaapaw ng ibabaw wa kailangan ng mga nakatira sa aming tahanan tuloy na lang hihila sa pinagdaanan ako'y minalas ako pa may kasalanan kasalanan pagkalaban sa mga nagmamayari at ari-arian tinatulan kahit delikado na gawain tuloy pa rin para lang merong maihain kano nga ba ang salapi magtrabaho nga ba o magpaapi dapat itama ang mga mali buhay ko ba'y katumbas ng salapi 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 On March 7, a series of operations conducted by state forces resulted in the deaths of nine activists in several parts of the southern Luzon. Oh, you know, 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 you know,
Papatahimik Pag-ibig yun na kami Masan ng paligid Hindi magkatakampagbasa Hindi ibig Basta ka pala mga liyo Pinilit na ihaw Labusal sa bunganga Sigaw makiba Kagiba makinarya Nansagta ni Kalahanda Nasa marcha ka sa Naambala Subo ay umaalam na Di kami na magsiwalat Ang baho nila Di kami na makiyak na pagkalas maya Di kami na pagsino pa ang pasis ng ama Di kami na kapag sinabi ko taklaga Tapos ng puniti ng papel at di kami malasedula Bukit lawi na kamao sa langit na Puhus kanit na pupot hari na Revolusyon e tunaw at tunaw at tunar
of uh, uh, other countries and the increase of the proletariat uh, in the whole world. So he thinks that supra-imperialism uh, develops capitalism in the world on a straight line. Uh, he does not uh, recognize uh, what Lenin said as the uneven development, the law of uneven development and the uneven um, flow of investments. There are um, surges, uh, spasms and um, uh, stoppages in the investment, uh, in the foreign investments done by uh, uh, imperialist countries. This is because the crisis of, of overproduction um, uh, intensifies the contradiction among the imperialist powers. And, uh, and of course, the objective of uh, uh, monopoly capitalism in exporting surplus capital is to exploit um, the uh, natural resources and uh, cheap labor in those countries. Uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, does not mind eh, how the, a, a foreign country would develop economically in a comprehensive and fundamental way. So, uh, crisis can be generated in the imperialist countries themselves or uh, in the whole world capitalist system. Uh, there would be spasms in the, in the demand for uh, uh, commodity, for commodities, uh, for certain commodities from the underdeveloped countries. Though there is the, uneven, the law of uneven development and the uh, law of contradictions um, between, the, between the imperialist countries and the, the non-imperialist countries. So I think uh, all this, this differentiation uh, between uh, uh, Lenin's uh, critique of imperialism and uh, Kautsky uh, Kautsky's theory of uh, supra-imperialism has, um, has uh, guided us, has, uh, has guided uh, uh, proletarian revolutionaries. And there are uh, other thoughts ramifying from Kautsky's uh, uh, theory of supra-imperialism. Um, the social democrats of the Second International supported the war budgets of uh, the imperialist countries, especially Germany, in the name of uh, uh, keeping peace uh, and in the name of uh, uh, patriotism or defense of the fatherland. So Lenin criticized what he called uh, super, I, uh, I mean to say, social pacifism, social pacifism. And he also criticized uh, social chauvinism. Um, so it's, it's an actual support of uh, uh, monopoly capitalism. Uh, the the uh, uh, social democrats of uh, the, the second international acted as uh, the tail, the parliamentary tail of the monopoly bourgeoisie. And uh, further on, uh, when uh, the social democrats uh, uh, acted uh, uh, to crush uh, to crush um, uh, the proletarian revolutionaries uh, uh, led by uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, um, uh, Leninists would begin to uh, uh, speak against uh, social pacifism, a uh, social fascism, social fascism. Because uh, at that time, uh, the Italian fascists had already uh, seized power. So they could speak of social fascist uh, uh, with uh, reference to the German social democrats who crushed the uh, uh, Spartacus and other uh, uh, and and uh, the, the the related movements of this of the, of the proletarian, proletarian revolutionaries. revolutionaries. Okay, thank and you. And so of much. course, uh, by the 1930s, uh, uh, the expression social chauvinism. So, excuse me. Social fascism, Pas social fascism, fascism yeah. would become would would, would ring louder because right there in Germany you have the rise already of Hitler, Hitler the uh, who uh, who, who tried to grab the yeah. term socialism, national uh, as national socialism, Nazism. and uh, so um, 
the uh, uh, fascism was already a general term to apply uh, to the uh, use of um, uh, 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 fascist uh, despotisms like those of uh, Hitler, Mussolini, and others uh, in other countries. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Here is a question uh, that goes, what do you think are the conditions that differentiate monopoly capitalism today as to how Lenin analyzed and critiqued it during his time more than a century ago? Of course, uh, the, the scale of monopoly capitalism has expanded um, uh, on the basis of the, uh, 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 the increasing use of science and technology, um, to improve the uh, 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 means of production and also to make more efficient uh, collective labor. And um, the last uh, two world wars taught the monopoly capitalists uh, a lot. Uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot crush established socialist society by aggression. It was the well demonstrated in the case of the Soviet Union then when the Nazi Germany invaded um, uh, invaded uh, 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 the Soviet Russia. Union. Um, the result was worse for capitalism, with several socialist countries arising and national liberation movements arising. So, um, uh, having become the number one imperialist power, the United States. Uh, uh, took, the, uh, took the initiative of uh, adopting new ways and new institutions for uh, maintaining capitalism. So the, the UN, the United Nations, um, was formed, the multilateral agencies uh, like uh, IMF, World Bank, and uh, the uh, Gut Round, uh, eventually the WTO would be formed. And the capitalist powers learned, uh, especially after the, uh, nu the, the, the nuclear monopoly um, of, uh, of uh, the West was broken. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the traditional imperialist powers headed by the US thought of new ways of confronting uh, the Soviet Union and the newly risen uh, socialist countries and uh, 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 national liberation movements, as well as the newly independent uh, countries. So they develop ways of, um, of uh, shifting the burden of crisis uh, uh, to, uh, to the third world. Uh, up to now, 84% of the population of the world belong to the, to the third world, to the global south, no? or to the underdeveloped countries. And it is a wide uh, field for the imperialist countries to, um, uh, to exploit no? uh, and oppress, and even that, uh, upon which um, proxy wars can be made, uh, and avoid, no? avoid a direct war. Uh, not only between the two superpowers um, uh, when the Soviet Union was still existing, but also to avoid uh, violent contradictions among the uh, traditional imperialist powers. So um, the U.S. Uh, had to adopt new ways of controlling uh, uh, the former fascist powers. At first, their uh, uh, reaction, the reaction of the U.S. and uh, together with England um, uh, was to keep uh, Germany and uh, Japan agricultural. But then, because one half of Germany had become red and uh, uh, had come under the uh, Communist Party, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, retracted from keeping down Germany economically. So they, uh, the U.S. even engaged in the Marshall Plan uh, because it was more concerned with uh, uh, developing 
West Germany as a bulwark against the East. No? So the Iron Curtain was set up. Mm. And also in Japan, because many of the Japanese troops uh, of the uh, fascist Japan were, in, were, uh, were, were given political education by the Communist Party. When they went back to Japan, they were joining either the Communist Party or the Socialist Party. Uh, so uh, what the U.S. did was to agree eh, to, uh, uh, to agree having Japan uh, uh, recover and uh, reindustrialize eh, uh, itself. And uh, as in Germany, the Juncker class was disposed of, so uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the traditional base of reaction the landlords were, uh, were, were put down with the, the land reform program initiated during the period of uh, MacArthur. So you have, you have adjustments. And then uh, uh, you have uh, uh, power players in, uh, among the strategic planners of the U.S., like Kissinger, like, you know, uh, utilizing what uh, uh, means of force are available. But you have also uh, strategic planners like Brzezinski, who understand, who understood very well the internals, the internals of socialist countries. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he understood very well how modern revisionism uh, could be utilized to the advantage of uh, uh, capitalism. And... Uh, in philosophical terms, uh, the most clever uh, opposition to Marxism-Leninism or dialectical materialism in philosophy has always been uh, 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 subjectivist uh, um, uh, empirical uh, philosophy. Uh, so in the time of Lenin, he had to confront uh, the empirical criticism of Marx. And... Uh, and in my time in the University of Philippines, I had to confront the logical positivism of, of, of Professor uh, Ricardo Pascual, who was an ally eh, against anti-communism, but who himself uh, uh, was a, um, a roundabout uh, supporter of capitalism. No, so, <laughs> uh, um, so you know, subjectivist uh, empirical philosophy is a, a big competitor, and. Um, and uh, you can find recruits within the Communist Party. You can you can find uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre or uh, Louis Althusser. Then you can also create uh, uh, the post-structuralist and the post-modernist philosophies, <laughs> <laughs> the anti-authoritarian authoritarian, uh, philosophers of the Frankfurt School. Mm. And then, of course, you have the uh, you have also the uh, thinkers of Austria, eh? Hayek, uh, Hayek, who is a stalwart uh, of neoliberalism and who considers uh, uh, socialism as the road to serfdom. And you have Karl Popper, eh? uh, ah. the, uh, who advocates Popper. society and who is against any kind of historicizing because it's supposed to lead to violence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you, the, the U.S. has been clever. It has been clever in developing... Uh, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. are the most clever in uh, manipulating these subjectivist philosophies in uh, continental Europe. <laughs> uh, and in political economy, of course, neoliberalism would arise. It was supposed to be a, a crackpot idea of uh, Ponis and uh, Hayek in the 1930s. It was supposed to be uh, it presented itself as a middle of the road um, between fascism and communism. Uh, but uh, what is fundamentally uh, wrong with this philosophy is it, it rejects even the liberal, classical liberal theory of uh, labor of Adam Smith and David Ricardo. It denies uh, the proletariat uh, the, the honor of being the creator of new material values, of social wealth. No? Um, so, it actually, uh, neoliberalism is not really liberalism of a new kind, but lib uh, 
it is anti liberalism it is against the it is against the uh, the most honest and uh, positive uh, meaning of li- of uh, liberal democracy uh, which was progressive uh, in its own time and imagine uh, uh, ascribing to the monopoly capitalist class uh, the role of being the creator of wealth and as uh, provider simply provider of jobs to this uh, to the passive proletariat no the proletariat is no longer the main, the, the creator of wealth so uh, i need not elaborate on uh, how uh, anti liberal anti human and anti proletariat <laughs> is the liberalism that has but that has been taken that has taken uh, hold of so many uh, people in the academia and uh, outside uh, the mm-hmm. academic institutions and they have been new liberalism has been adapted since uh, the late 19 uh, 1970s uh, as the solution to the stagflation in the US yeah when so Friedman have, uh, Milton Friedman yeah. The, uh, yeah. the Chicago school Chicago uh, the, school. the, the fraternal uh, club uh, Uh, of the Austrian school and um, uh, you see uh, uh, there was a concurrence uh, there was a concurrence of uh, of uh, neoliberalism and modern revisionism um, this is the uh, if I may uh, present the uh, series of uh, polit- intellectual and political currents uh, which proletarian revolutionaries have had to deal with since after World War II. You have uh, uh, first, you have the, the anti-communism and Cold War. Hmm. Then that was would be followed by um, ideas of neo-Keynesianism because the, the U.S. Uh, used public works hmm. uh, again in the 70s but that was not enough the stagflation would not be lit any kind any kind of more uh, more investments more meant more stagnation more reduction of uh, the interest rate means uh, 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 more stagnation and at the same time inflation was going on so um, so they resorted to neoliberalism and by the way uh, before neoliberalism you, uh, with regard to the underdeveloped countries neo neo colonialism was adopted so anti communism or cold war neo uh, colonialism then uh, keynesian the keynesian uh, neo keynesian approach or sometimes they call it mixed economy um, and then you have the neoliberalism exactly when neoliberalism was being promoted the uh, uh, Modern revisionists were quite successful in subverting uh, uh, Soviet society. And uh, in um, the Chinese revolution was sort of overtaken by revisionism because in the 1950s, while Khrushchev was riding high, uh, so many Chinese students and worker trainees were sent to the Soviet Union. So that would bring in a lot of uh, Soviet modern revisionists. So they, it was a problem for Mao, the worship of uh, the Soviet Union, whatever it was, even if it was already revisionist. So that's the problem. Um, so, okay. uh, but the most important thing that uh, in economic uh, and political terms, uh, the most clever uh, uh, methods or programs and methods that the uh, traditional imperialist uh, use was to, you know, shift the burden of crisis to the third world. Okay. Um, and then they avoid wars among themselves. So there has been no direct war between any imperialist power mm. or between any blocks of uh, imperialist powers in the last more than 70 years. So this is something new. Um, uh, but then... Um, something worse is coming up uh, because uh, while there was a, there seemed to be a concert of neoliberalism among mm-hmm. all um, imperialist powers including the traditional ones and the new ones like china and russia uh, there is now 
intensification of contradictions among them. Okay. So, and uh, uh, aside from the, con uh, the aside from the uh, uh, intensification of class struggle everywhere, you have also the um, you have also uh, 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 the, the the threat of the use of weapons of mass destruction, not only nuclear but other means of uh, 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 mass destruction, including uh, uh, biological warfare. Yeah? So, you know, there's now a debate uh, whether this uh, uh, COVID-19 was the product of uh, laboratory, <laughs> laboratory work, uh, whether it came from Fort Derrick in the U.S. or it came from Wuhan. That's the end. <laughs> and then, of course, the attack, even in peacetime, the attack, on uh, and the environment through imperialist plunder results in global warming and um, uh, with all these problems to mind uh, to be worried about and for the people to get angry about i think uh, uh, we are moving towards a point where the people will rise up no? against imperialism and all its uh, consequences uh, including class exploitation, uh, the danger of annihilation by weapons of mass destruction, and global warming. So, uh, 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 after World War II, or after, you know, uh, the end of the, um, uh, after the end of the uh, Cold War, uh, oil crisis. There's a, se a second world uh, Cold War brewing, brewing mm -hmm. up. But uh, I think the uh, it is entirely possible for the peoples of the world, especially those in the third world, who have been the victims, uh, who have been the uh, the worst victims of imperialism, would rise up, um, and um, uh, we should, uh, of course. Uh, the imperialists have always uh, uh, carried, out, carried out the wars that resulted in the rise of uh, socialism. But uh, the people can very well rise up for two reasons. The social character of production has risen tremendously. Mm. Uh, and so uh, the imperialists cannot handle the crisis of overproduction. Okay. Uh, and, and the means of communication uh, has so have so risen that uh, people like us can use uh, uh, can communicate to each other eh, in seconds. Hmm. Before Lenin used only the train to carry the pravda, okay. eh? yeah. and then later on there will be planes. Later on the past, uh, but this time you have uh, instant. Now you have end the line online. Okay. And but the most important thing is uh, neither the propaganda of the enemy or the propaganda of the revolution. When the propaganda of reality eh, uh, speaks louder than the propaganda of any side, and if the revolutionary pro uh, 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 propaganda is sustained by the more powerful propaganda of social reality and the crisis, eh, that's the end of imperialism. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor. Now we go to the third question. What do you think are the conditions that differentiate the development of monopoly capitalism in rising imperialist powers like the US, Japan, and Germany against the old imperialist powers of the UK, France, Belgium, Russia before the advent of uh, the First World War? Uh, uh, of course, of course uh, 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 you can, you can, uh, uh, we, can we can appreciate no? No? How, how the US, the US and, Japan and Japan and Germany, and Germany without the advantage of uh, colonies uh, um, uh, like the UK, France and Belgium and Russia uh, would be able to uh, um, take their own uh, uh, shares of the melon. No? Uh, these countries, uh, U.S., Japan, U.S. and Japan, uh, were practically um, uh, outside uh, of the mud race to making colonies in Africa. But uh, uh, all, all these new uh, imperialist powers, 
um, were engaged in uh, um, apportioning, were, were, uh, were, were, were participated in the division of the Chinese melon. <laughs> China was the was the area for uh, uh, colonial expansion for the three, and then also uh, the U.S. made war on Spanish colonialism to take Cuba, uh, uh, the Philippines uh, as as uh, as colonies. Uh, uh, it and then of course uh, it. Um, took over Latin America. But of course, uh, the, uh, the Britain was already in Latin America, uh, the surplus capital of, uh, and surplus goods of UK were already uh, entering Latin America. Uh, the Japan and Germany had the, had the least uh, acquisi uh, colonial acquisitions. So they were the most uh, uh, hungry uh, and for, for space. <laughs> Japan could only take over uh, uh, bits of China uh, for a while, uh, like Taiwan, like pieces of Manchuria. Um, and then when Germany and then the colonial uh, uh, spheres, of, the spheres of influence of Germany would be given to Japan no? as, a result, as a result of World War I. And that uh, enraged eh, the Chinese youth and people. Um, now, uh, UK, France, Belgium, uh, uh, they've been able to adjust to the uh, um, to conditions uh, after World War One and World War Two, and um, they were on the winning side. Uh, then Russia, uh, the big death of Russia, who was simply pushed to join um, the powers. Um, uh, it was just ordered by their uh, uh, British uh, 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 creditors uh, to join the uh, to join the war against the Central Powers. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Russia would become would be the weakest link in the chain of imperialist countries and uh, would uh, be the platform for the first socially successful socialist uh, revolution with Lenin uh, uh, realizing his uh, line that uh, the imperialist war can be turned into civil war. Uh, Russia was capitalist already with some industrial enclaves uh, surrounded by a, a large ocean of medievalism. And Russia, like England, was um, getting a lot of uh, 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 getting a lot of surplus capital by exploiting the colonies, and Russia also uh, invested in in some um, uh, enterprises like the development of the fuel, the oil industry in Baku, and then uh, aside from you know the industrial enclaves in Moscow and Petrograd. Um, so the, 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 the at that of World War Two. Yeah. Um, Magneto Gok. Well, uh, the latecomers in the colonial game uh, had to uh, had to exert more effort uh, in order to have their own uh, colonial possessions. And the U.S. was clever in uh, sidling sidling to U.K. You know, the Anglo-American uh, uh, combination. Yeah, that was the, most, the strongest. Uh, that has been the strongest for some time until the end of World War II. The U.S. became number one only after World War II. Eh? But uh, before World War II, the, uh, the U.S. and uh, U.K., the Anglo-American combination was uh, the strongest. And then France, Belgium would be able to adjust. Uh, Japan and Germany turned fascist. Uh, because they they were so deprived <laughs> of colonies mm -hmm. that they, they thought by uh, uh, engaging in war they can they can also have more colonies uh, but they were defeated and they had to uh, submit uh, to the to the rule of the winners okay the fourth question during the socialist takeover if there is going to be a socialist takeover 
how would the state treat big capitalists? Would they still be able to be part of the industry or would they be given a concession? Well, and the, the big capitalists uh, can be, uh, in, in the context of the Philippine society, the big compradors could be, the big capitalists would be just big compradors. Uh, we don't have big industrialists. Eh? Um, um, you can call, you know, some big compradors, big industri industrialists as big manufacturers because you know, they also engage in manufacturing. Uh, for instance, the Ayalas, you know, they have the banks Chinese. and the trading firms. And at the same time, they have some uh, some manufacturing. You usually this Filipino, especially the Filipino Chinese big compradors, uh, they have also some big companies in food and beverage uh, uh, production. And then, you know, in the, you know, this uh, reassembly types of uh, uh, companies. So how do we deal with the big compradors of the revolution? Those who uh, sided with the uh, reactionary government, who never paid, those who never paid their taxes to the revolutionary government before victory, uh, their properties will have to be confiscated. Okay, that's good. But those big compradors who uh, paid taxes and uh, uh, brought their products, useful products, to the uh, base areas, uh, they can be considered um, national bourgeois if they follow the state policy of building socialism and accept uh, being in state private corporations, yes. state private corporations. And then um, um, the guidelines of the revolutionary movement can come from the new economic policy of Lenin or uh, the period of... Um, um, basic socialization of the Chinese economy from 1953 to 57. Mm. Uh, this uh, uh, bourgeoisie, uh, 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 this big bourgeois investors in the state private corporations will get dividends. I hope the dividends will not be so big. In China, up to 57, the dividends uh, amounted to 25%. Of the net in, of the net income of the of the state private corporations, Not and that, that was a source of debate between Mao and the revisionists. Mm. Uh, the revisionists wanted to prolong uh, the payment of dividends. Mao ideas uh, Mao's idea before the Great Leap Forward was to uh, uh, to uh, consider consider the investment, the shares of the big uh, of the, the of the capitalist as uh, as if it were money deposited in the bank. It only receives interest mm. because these capitalists have their children, you know. Uh, uh, they, they have the benefit of studying in the free public education. Uh, they're already aging and they have their servants. They have their nice houses. They even have, they can even travel yeah, to, uh, to have vacations abroad, no? Yeah. So, uh, some people would think the communists just cut off the heads of all the capitalists. <laughs> it's <laughs> the, not true. The capitalists yeah. who, were, who were considered patriotic uh, were given concessions. It was in the Great Leap Forward, in the, in the policy setting uh, uh, of, uh, the, for the Great Leap Forward that there would be a serious division between the right opportunists and the revisionists on one side and the Mao followers. So there is really that period in which concessions are given to the capitalists because uh, this is a, it, it, this is explained this way. This is the so-called Lenin buying off policy. It is better to keep uh, it is better to keep the patriotic capitalists stay than rather than run away out of fear together with the managers, you know, they, they would infect the thinking of their managers and their competent personnel, no? Because uh, after winning the revolution, you don't have enough communists to, to, to replace, to replace uh, all the managers and the competent uh, personnel, like the engineers, no? Uh, you would even give higher pay eh, to the engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and the uh, truly competent managers. 
The same thing in government. You remove only the Kuomintang uh, the officials. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, even before the revolution, you have already uh, communists among the middle rank and junior rank uh, government employees. Mm -hmm. And that's, how, that's why there are unions. Huh? So uh, you don't have much problem in... Uh, in uh, having enough people in government, no? Uh, when you take over, but in, uh, in the economy, because there are you know the most competent people, not just the owners of uh, capital, they have competencies that you cannot supply. And it would be more expensive to get the foreign, friendly foreign uh, uh, experts. Technocrats. Yeah. In the case of China, it was so expensive uh, to have Soviet experts because you have to build houses for them uh, mm -hmm. up to the level of Soviet uh, uh, standard <laughs> of living. You have to give uh, higher salaries. So uh, you can use foreign experts, but uh, as much as possible, it's more economical to keep the local experts. You know? Do not frighten them. Uh, you give them lectures on uh, educational courses on socialism. You do that in the private enterprises as well as in in, in the government service. Uh, you, you get the logic of uh, <laughs> concessions. It's more expensive <laughs> to um, to get foreign experts. Um, okay. Do you want a short break? There are two more questions, and then we'll just have a little break, and then we will proceed with the two questions after the break. Say a five-minute break. Professor? Alis na ako, naunahan pa yung araw Almusal ko yung bahaw Agawan ng jeep at trabaho At traffic pa sa may kalaw Halos hindi na ako umuwi Puro na lang ako talaw Sa tahanang maliliit Kada buwan, lumang libo Inuuwi ko, sakit balikat Likod at ulo, malaki na raw Ba't pa ako nagre-reklamo Talagang tikis trabaho Talagang linis ang baho Nang boss na ang Amerikano Kontraktual, artiladong katawan Binibigay lahat mula balat hanggang laman Hanap naman ng bago pagtapos ng ilang buwan Ginagawa lahat, magdalaman lang ang dyan Maglalo nga ba ako sa lupi? Magtrabaho nga ba ako magpaapi? Hanggang labihan ka kami Mabuhay yung maayos hanggang sa makaraos Wala ang maga hanggang gabi Maglalo nga ba ako sa lupi? Kasi hindi nakatapos At kayo't kalabaw Nakakapamintig ng pagod Nalulunod pero sumusuong pa rin sa agos Parang kailangang sumigaw Para lang di mapaos Matay kong bukura
masakit Lumiban pa saglit Di magkamayaw ilang araw Di kumagaling Naipon ang gawain Amoy kalit na sakin Si sating abot kung hindi Kayanin pang hapulin questions that we have here of the audience uh, Professor with Russia and China reverting to imperialism after the death of uh, Stalin now, how will the in the future uh, to be if we have a new society to be built in the country do you believe that colonies of the empire may be liberated first before the empire falls? When and if uh, the Philippine Revolution will uh, succeed in uh, winning the new democratic, uh, the stage of uh, new democratic revolution and um, uh, reaches the socialist stage, it will learn positive lessons as well as negative lessons from the previous socialist societies and um, well uh, I, I suppose that is basic and there are you know supposed fundamental lessons uh, of a negative uh, kind uh, for instance Mao criticized Stalin for taking harsh administrative measures against those regarded as agents of bourge, the bourgeoisie and the landlord class you know <laughs> but I think I think there was some mistake uh, also on the part of Mao huh? uh, my, yes. you know, maybe this is your first time to hear me criticizing Mao okay okay, okay. Uh, uh, if uh, Stalin was harsh Mao was soft no <laughs> he was so soft only two one of the two biggest uh, capitalist rulers, Deng Xiaoping yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, because they had some uh, uh, long-running good relations, especially because of Chow and Lai, uh, who was actually, uh, who had Deng Xiaoping as his protege. But anyway, Deng Xiaoping uh, took the side of Mao in 1932 against the so-called Bolshevik group, eh? uh, sent by the Comintern uh, to Chen Kansan to meddle in the, to meddle in the people's war and um, and caused a lot of damage by you know uh, uh, cause uh, by causing the redeployment of the forces of the people's army to the attack on on urban areas huh? that's uh, you know uh, upsetting uh, upsetting the uh, the defenses and uh, strength of the People's Army in Chinkansan. So there was uh, uh, in third, in the third, um, in the fourth and fifth encount, uh, encirclement, the Red Army was uh, uh, defeated, and, and, and the Red Army had to make the long march. And of course, in at Chunyi, Chou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping also supported Mao. Now, when well, after, after. Um, after uh, in 1966, uh, 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 when Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping were overthrown as the biggest capitalist rulers, uh, Liu Xiaoqi was sent to prison. Deng Xiaoping was only sent to Changxi to do uh, to do uh, work uh, uh, to do work, no, um, and. Uh, he, Mao even assigned someone to to look after his safety. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, uh, the error here was not in being harsh, uh, but in being in kind, so. and soft. No? Uh, you know, uh, Deng Xiaoping should never have been rehabilitated. No, uh, but uh, but I don't think he should be sent to prison. No. He can be retired, pensioned off, no, pensioned off. No, if you are going to be kind to anyone, pension him, him off. If, uh, especially if he's known at being clever in using terminology, uh, because 
uh, it could easily be established that he was using diplomatic struggle against the Soviet Union to justify modernization, capitalist reforms, and um, cooperation with the U.S. in reintegration of the world capitalism to go against the principle of class struggle. Uh, that was already being, um, yeah, that was already the, the key link in the developments inside China. So the class struggle was uh, was uh, trounced by, you know, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, struggle. No? And even Mao allowed himself to be, you know, to grace uh, diplomatic occasions, no? like, like, like kissing Emil de Marcos or, uh, 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 of course, uh, being chummy chummy with, uh, 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 with Nixon and so on. No? So, anyway, um, uh, you can be critical of Mao because without uh, being, you know, against his basic principles. No? Uh, but in in, in the yeah. concrete uh, in in concrete matters, uh, there can be errors. No one is perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So um, the um, uh, so there is such a thing as learning from the positive lessons. I didn't enumerate all of them. There are too many, and also the negative lessons. Uh, I've also already mentioned some, um, but. Uh, there is a lot of uh, road to 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 tread to tread on before yeah we come to that point of uh, um, having socialism in the Philippines to defend and uh, and promote no um, there are certain possibilities that could make things easy for the Philippines aside you know aside from being self reliant and knowing what to do on the basis of historical experience. Uh, of former of previous socialist countries, it's possible that the, um, although um, that possibility it has been quite uh, overstretched. Uh, um, when uh, capitalist restoration occurred in Russia and China, I thought for a while that uh, um, in a matter of decades there could be a uh, uh, a movement among the people. To restore socialism, uh, it has not happened. For four decades, uh, so many decades have passed. But that's that remains a possibility, because uh, right now, you see, uh, there are wise guys in the in the Soviet Union saying, "Oh, it doesn't matter that Russia uh, uh, be, uh, went down to its size and gave up the and gave up the Soviet Empire." Uh, and what is the name of this uh, Soviet uh, advisor of uh, Yeltsin and Putin for a while? Mm -hmm. And this wise guy says, uh, oh, it's good that uh, uh, Russia has become more compact uh, and um, it is more prosperous, supposedly, because of the oil income. Uh, and it has done away with, uh, with, with the, with, with the uh, parasites. Huh? He considers Ukraine as a parasite. All the Ukraine would complain, no, that Russia, that Soviet Union was taking so much wheat, no, and and is paying so much for oil, no. All it was at the bargain price. And then poor Georgia, <laughs> yeah. uh, which became obviously poor after being separated from the Soviet Union, after uh, 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 he he considers as simply a a, a burden, no. And that is in line with the Gorbachev idea that uh, revolutions are cheap, but when they win, they become a big burden to the big to the big socialist country like uh, the Soviet Union. That's the way, you know. Mm. Mm. Communists are supposed to act according to the communist spirit, even if the reality of communism is not yet. No, but this ego, this selfishness, shows. Really, among these, uh, uh, among these uh, revisionists, and in China under Deng Xiaoping, you know, there is no mention of the proletariat, the party of the proletariat, always party of the people. So it's bourgeois populism, and no reference to proletarian internationalism. Mm, yeah. But if any one of these former socialist countries should become socialist again, uh, that would be that would be a big help. Now, let us assume that they remain capitalist. But they are in serious contradictions with U.S. imperialism because U.S. imperialism is still the number one imperialist power in the Philippines. Uh, Unilateral. The, the, the Communist Party of the Philippines can very well tell China, tell China 
Um, don't be too greedy. Uh, withdraw. Eh? Withdraw from uh, the West Philippine Sea. Eh? And you have no problem of being accused uh, of uh, being a violator of Philippine sovereignty. Eh? And the Philippine, Filipino revolutionaries would support China's sovereignty over Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, uh, Tibet, Xinjiang, because really, according to international law uh, and according to uh, to history, uh, those belong to the uh, to the uh, uh, to to China. Uh, but respect eh? the agreements that you made eh? with the with uh, uh, like uh, people having autonomy rights in uh, Hong Kong, Tibet, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you abuse democratic rights, uh, the, 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 the um, Communist Party will continue to criticize you. Uh, and then, um, uh, if you are helpful in certain matters, because you know the Chinese say, oh, don't offend China because uh, you will need China when you win the revolution. While you are not yet a winner in the sense of taking over Manila and other urban areas, we cannot deal with you because we only deal with bourgeois parties like mm. PD Pilaban. That's the dungiest stupidity and betrayal of uh, proletarian internationalism. They don't have anything to do with the Communist Party especially if it is waging uh, armed revolution. They will only deal with a party if it is in power, be mm. it the kind of government of Duterte or the governments that exist in Cuba, Venezuela, and so on. Um, now, the possibility of having a friendly China uh, are indicated by uh, it's uh, so far uh, good relations with Cuba, Venezuela, um, uh, the Democratic People's Republic of China. Because indeed, if the Philippine Revolution would win, you need some uh, sources of certain things. Huh? Okay. Uh, you can be cut off from oil supplies if the uh, oil will still be uh, will, will still be uh, uh, needed, no? Uh, I, I think it will take time for uh, for the Filipinos to do to use the tidal waves eh, of the sea <laughs> to generate fuel well and <laughs> completely dispose of fossil <laughs> energy or uh, use so the solar and wind eh, power. No, so um, there are things that can be provided, and there can be bridges. Eh? So at this time, that the socialist countries, which were the strong bulwarks of the past are gone for a while. Um, it is so precious to have good relations with certain countries that are relatively progressive, even if uh, they are progressive in the sense that they have some amount of public ownership of the means of production, uh, uh, and then they have a good social service system in health, education, and so forth. And they are anti-imperialist. It's important to have anti-imperialist countries that still exist. And of course, uh, 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 DPRK is still the object of, uh, is still the target of uncompromising attacks by imperialism. So uh, it has the potential of being a good friend of, uh, okay. uh, a good friend of the Philippine Revolution. Uh, there are things that they can uh, provide as useful, no? Um, uh, especially if the country is already in power, if the, 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 if the Communist Party is already in power in the Philippines. You know? uh, with regard to the question whether colonies should be uh, uh, maybe liberated first before the empire, well, uh, uh, as a result of the socialist revolutions, it became easier. And then the historical fact is that the socialist revolutions occurred before there was a rapid process of decolonization. But the so, but before the imperialist and colonial powers ag, uh, acceded to the process of decolonization, and there are people in colonies had to fight for national liberation. Um, and 
We have uh, the Filipino people have an outstanding record in this. Eh? As early as 1898, we were the first Asian people to defeat a Western colonial power uh, like Spain. And we were the first to fight U.S. imperialism. Uh, the only thing we haven't done yet is what the Vietnamese have already done, no? to defeat U.S. imperialism. Eh? Uh, so, uh, now, um, but the imperialist powers, uh, although acceding to uh, decolonization, introduced new colonialism, and the, and the U.S. and the British have been experts at giving nominal, uh, at, at the, you know, uh, nominal grants of independence. So, um, you have to take that into account. Uh, uh, there is the, there are the notions like this. You know. Once upon a time, there was the notion that socialism is the most possible in England because of the most developed forces of production there. Yeah, advanced uh, means of production and um, uh, industrial proletariat, well organized, but uh, uh, strong capitalist countries are also the strongest in resisting, in resisting revolution. No? They even resort to fascism uh, before, um, before uh, there is a chance for, uh, before the proletariat can can establish socialist power. So, so Lenin would say, ah, it's possible. It's more possible to make socialist revolution at the weak point in the, in the chain of imperialist powers. So he proved it in Russia. Hmm. And then onwards, uh, onwards, there was the notion, uh, or there was the calculation that uh, imperialism would be easier with to be it would be it would be easier to defeat imperialism in the less developed countries so that was proven in china and also in several countries um in indochina and so i think um, it is uh, it is valid to say where uh, imperialism is weakest the chance of making socialist revolution is uh, uh, is uh, more probable than in countries where capitalism is stronger, and so uh, I would say that um, before you have widespread socialist revolutions in the imperialist countries, you must have them. You you must have at least the two stage revolutions in the in many underdeveloped countries so or there could be a simultaneous occurrence mm. of um, of uh, one or two revolutions in the former socialist countries and in capitalist countries and more revolutions in the underdeveloped countries that could be that's a possibility um the philippines is a has a um, uh, disadva has, an, has a, a disadvantage and advantage in being archipelagic. Uh, mm -hmm. the, big dis the, the, the big disadvantage is that uh, cross-border uh, mutual support with other countries uh, uh, is quite difficult. No? Um, mm -hmm. but, but of course, there is a long-term advantage uh, in that uh, you can uh, chop up the strength of the enemy not only by the division between countryside and uh, cities, but also uh, the archipelagic uh, uh, fragmented uh, yeah. the many islands in the Philippines, uh, mm -hmm. eleven of which contain ninety four percent. So uh, it's not a, 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 but uh, having eleven uh, eleven uh, in in the eleven areas, you can uh, you can build uh, armies ranging from companies to uh, companies to uh, oh. regiments enough to destroy the power of the enemy, uh, and the the Philippine revolution so far has proven uh, that it can kick out, it can kick out, uh, it can defeat an enemy. Uh, yeah. uh, the 
Read the Spaniards with only some 20, with only some 5,000 troops uh, in the end could easily be driven. And um, But uh, in the anti-Japanese struggle, this is not uh, mentioned. You know, the, after uh, the Japanese uh, uh, were already defeated in the air battles, in the naval battles, uh, Yamashita put together 150,000 troops in the Cordillera, and eh? eh, in the, especially in Ifugao. Mm. Only 50,000 uh, remained of that. Eh? So, uh, but the, this, uh, this, uh, they were wiped out. Okay, 100,000. Even wiped. done by Yusape, yeah, Ilocanos and Igorots. <laughs> Under you, Sabine, is it still, a, still an achievement of the Filipino people? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We love to celebrate the pitch like Bataan or okay. uh, um, pioneering, small but pioneering victories like um, Lapu Lapu killing eight, only eight. He killed only eight. <laughs> but what made his act uh, very prominent is that he killed Magellan, no less. <laughs> oh, the big, the big so, head, the uh, admiral. You know, okay. it, it, narrow scales of the 11 islands, great battles are possible, uh, especially when they are timed with uh, great battles elsewhere, like in India or what. You know? you know, India is the most promising big country for for a new socialist, for a socialist revolution. It plays the role of the big country, like Russia uh, in connection with World War One, China in connection with World War II. Um, uh, but if they don't do well, uh, maybe in, uh, in Ireland, in the island world of Southeast Asia, uh, you know, the Philippines and Indonesia have a big population. If only these people would uh, wage people's war at the same time, that would be a big problem for imperialism. And then uh, I suppose that Vietnam will be, will, will uh, even if subjected to capitalist pressures and influences, uh, could be helpful. So it's good to make friends at the time that they, to make friends with anti-imperialist countries or those countries with some amount of anti-imperialism uh, at this time that the big socialist brothers uh, are uh, on hibernation. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. We are now down to the last question. Capitalism is so vulnerable if we speak of the, the crisis-dependent path of capitalism. Capitalism actually runs on the line with uh, uh, all the crisis in it. So... Uh, when do you have now... Uh, you can destroy uh, its... Uh, can, three monstrosities can... going on at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Please, okay. Please capitalism is so vulnerable that... Um, it can destroy itself anytime soon and experience an economic crash. Do you think this could trigger another war? And what is the stand of the national democratic movement in the Philippines in having world wars? Well, you have now three monstrosities going on uh, because of monopoly capitalism. This is, these are uh, neoliberalism, state terrorism uh, and uh, wars of aggression. These are going on, although no direct wars among, among the imperialist powers yet. And, uh, you know, uh, neoliber neoliberalism is uh, manifested not just by, you know, the, uh, you know, the anti-worker propositions, you know, but, you know, neoliberalism has extended to uh, you know, financing private constructions and so on. So you have this uh, new billionaires in the Philippines, you know, as in the in, as in the West, no, building uh, you know these skyscrapers, you know, uh, and you have uh, 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 you know the most thoughtless forms of consumerism uh, that is supposed to you know bribe the uh, the general population. But uh, if you sum sum this up. You have a big public debt bubble. Huh? Okay. Uh, <laughs> even the developed and underdeveloped countries face this problem collectively. And um, uh, the big bubble is the three times bigger 
than the, the size of their economies. So this is about to explode. And now you have the intensification of the uh, interimperialist contradictions. And uh, the main players here uh, on certain scales, that supposedly the principal players are China and US. And then, of course, you have the traditional um, imperialist powers together against the two new imperialist powers, China and Russia. Um, at this moment, uh, uh, if you focus on the China, on the U.S.-China contradiction, um, this can result in a mutual weakening. And uh, uh, China still plays, you know, uh, the Uriah Heap in the Charles Dickens novel. So, uh, uh, a country that uh, seeks advantages by by uh, by capitalizing on its poverty, so-called. No? Well, of course, now that it has out really outwitted the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in in the <laughs> Chinese capitalism at the expense of the U.S. Uh, and now they, they keep on saying about uh, the peaceful economic crisis. They don't want war, but anyway, at any rate, they don't want war. But do they they they, pre they build up their uh, military capacity only for defense? But uh, you can never tell, even if I maintain the bar bright uh, uh, prospecting about Russia and China, about uh, proletarian revolutionary forces rearising, China and Russia. Uh, you know, who knows? Fascism uh, but arise in these countries, and that could uh, uh, that could uh, speed up uh, the danger of war, direct war among the imperialist powers, and also the prospect of fascism be, uh, in uh, in the traditional imperialist countries are there. You will notice that before the communist parties could reemerge as proletarian revolutionaries after, you know, being dazed, yeah? dazed and confused by modern revisionism and then by by some so-called left social democrat, uh, uh, democratic uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rearrangement and so on. Up to now, you know, I've also sent, uh, I've also seen some left parties becoming social democratic, you no? Know? So you have this, uh, uh, before you have this uh, um, communist parties that can take advantage of the crisis of imperialism, the big bureaucracy is also already financing fascist groups. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they are doing directed, uh, they are, because they love Israel, uh, they turn the immigrants, the migrants, as the uh, as the as the minority easy minority target no mm -hmm. uh, so you have uh, fascism on the rise in both new and uh, international uh, in both new and traditional imperialist powers um chauvinism uh, which is an ingredient of fascism is going strong in china and russia uh, mm -hmm. So is it. So this chauvinism also is developing in the traditional imperialist powers. So indeed, capitalism uh, is uh, breeding a lot of uh, monstrosities. Um, <coughs> uh, but these monstrosities, monstrosities are what drive the people uh, to revolution ultimately. And right now, the mass struggles. The mass struggles and anti-imperialist and democratic, they're spreading on a global scale. And these are uh, the prelude to the resurgence of the forces of the world proletarian revolution. That's just my optimistic view. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Professor. I have not seen the time, but we have gone to from 4 to about 6 p.m., and before we end, we would like to advertise the Jose Maria Sison books available on major platforms. We have the uh, book on the critique to the political, the Philippine uh, political economy, the philosophy on the philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism. 
on culture, art, and literature, and we also have resist neoliberalism, fascism, and wars of aggression, upsurge of people's resistance in the Philippines and the world. And then we have the Philippine society and revolution. So there are many materials that we can actually buy through Anakbayan in Europa, and the link will be posted in the Anakbayan Europa Facebook page. Uh, so Okay, this is the end of our session, our end line online on the special topic, the critique of Lenin to monopoly capitalism. I'd like to ask Professor Kisan for his last uh, message to the audience, please. Once more, I would like to uh, uh, thank. Um, uh, Anakbayan Europe, the ND School Online, Professor uh, uh, Pibri, uh, Sanchez, and uh, all our uh, listeners, and uh, especially those who raise questions. Uh, the, the session has been uh, quite uh, um, uh, uh, successful. Uh, in clarifying uh, important uh, matters, and um, and uh, I'm also thankful that the questions uh, um, required me to answer as best as I could. No, and uh, uh, thank you for this interaction. Uh, we learn from each other. Uh, uh, that's how uh, education should be. Uh, in any kind of uh, mode, uh, and before I, uh, I I missed certain uh, certain questions like what is the stand of the NDF ND National Democratic Movement in the Philippines in having war, war, wars, and before that uh, uh, the crisis could result in uh, war. Well, uh, the National Democratic Movement, as a matter of uh, uh, principle, fundamental principle, is to oppose wars, um, and um, especially wars of aggression and uh, wars for for, for uh, certain ex oppressive forces to control others. And uh, indeed, we have to be alert to the possibility that uh, uh, war, inter-imperialist war, could result from the, uh, the recurrent and ever worsening crisis of the world capitalist system. So uh, the broad masses of the people all over the world should be alerted to this danger of war, mm -hmm. and they should they take the initiative in uh, stopping uh, the monopoly bourgeoisie from launching wars of aggression. So uh, that is, uh, I would like to make that clear. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, the war is inevitable, and as a poor state, we should be good enough to face whatever monopoly capitalist will impose on us. So that ends our session this afternoon. This is Professor Sanchez from the University of the Philippines, Cebu. I would like to thank the audience and to encourage everyone to continue the conversation because it's an opportunity to be able to converse with Professor Jose Maria Sison regularly. This is only a Sunday um, school. The ND line online is actually happening only every Sunday afternoon. And today's session is quite extensive. We reached to about two hours. Thank you so much and good afternoon until the next um, ND line online for the next Sunday. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Tulog 
Pa sila paalis na ako na unahan pa yung araw Almusal ko yung baho Agawan ng jeep at trabaho At traffic pa sa may kalaw Halos hindi na ako umuwi Puro na lang ako talaw Sa tahanang maliki Kada buwan, limang libo Inuuwi ko, sakit balikat Likod at ulo, malaki na raw Ba't pa ako nagre-reklamo Talagang tiis trabaho Talagang linis ang baho Nang boss na Amerikano Kontraktual, artiladong katawan Binigay lahat, wala balat hanggang laman Hanap naman ng bago pagtapos ng ilang buwan Ginagawa lahat, magkalaman lang at dyan Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Magtrabaho nga ba o magpaapi? Hanggang labihan ka kami Mabuhay ang maayos hanggang sa mga karaos Wala ang maga hanggang gabi Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Natutong makipagsapal na rin Kahit parang ito na yung kapalaran Na kaya kong abutin Kay rapan ng sakit na di ko kayang gamutin Kahit ano pang gawin Kahit lang hanggang hindi lang kanin ang tutupin Kasalanan ko raw Kasi hindi nakatapos At kayo't kalabaw Nakakapamintig sa pagod Nalulunod pero sumusuong pa rin sa agos Parang kailangang sumigaw Para lang di mapaos Matay ko March 7.